a single simple rule is never use assumptive information on your maps. Never, ever, ever, ever. The quality of your JMs determines the quality of solutions that you can stem from them. And the goal of the goal is process improvement, not problem creation, right? So real personas, real empathy maps. If you don't know what those are, I'll definitely be showing you soon. Real timelines and real experiences as well. Today I'm going to be teaching us about how to make, how to better enrich our journey maps, right? I see a lot of journey maps, I to take my time, and I see a lot of process maps, and I know that um, there are a lot of problems that, you know, a lot of us have shared. If you've attended any UX pressure video before, it's pretty much a common concern for journey mapping persons or even process map individuals. Basically, if you're in the process improvement space, it's not a new, um, problem to say your journey maps are not converting, um, you know, they just look like pretty documents and they're not doing anything for the business or for you. So today we're going to do our very best at tackling that. All right. So you already met me. My name is Chidara Okoli. Um, I like, one of my favorite things I like to say is I design and that strategy, not Adobe. So I pretty much can't drop anything on Figma, but yeah, I do strategy. So yes, I'm a designer. Um, everything Veronica said, and other than that, my favorite other thing is to learn German. I love learning German and listening to podcasts as well. Um, yeah. So this is the overview for today. And then right into it. So some of the problems that I gathered that I've seen in the past are GMs and if you're new here and you do not know what JMs are, I would run through every abbreviation. Usually, everybody here is mostly you know, used to the terms, but just in case there's some of us that are new here, you're welcome all the same. JM means journey mapping. CJM means customer journey mapping. PI means process improvement. Um, if there are any new ones along the line that I use, I'll definitely try to make them clearer. All right, so your JMs are not converting to progress. The business's internal processes are very siloed. You don't get buy-in from process stakeholders. And the last one I got was, it's difficult to justify you know, the effort. So return on investment and the bottom line effect of your maps. So um, I'll just take time to ask us what other problems you may be facing with journey maps in general. If I'll take about two. You can use the chat and then we'll proceed. Okay. People don't see the value. Problem three, yeah. Thank you, Don, and thank you, Rose. Okay, people don't see value. That's a big one, and that, that's really hurtful because journey maps do take a long time. Process mapping does take a long time. I mean, that's the implementing. Okay, problem four. Justify the efforts. Problem four a lot. <laughs> Lovely, lovely. All right. So yes, common interest. And I mean, and if you're journey mapping and you pretty much have any of these problems, also safe to say that this is a safe place because it's not out of place. Um, something I say every time is a lot of times it's always easier when marketing teams write their budget of your marketing team. I love you as well, but it's usually easier for them to get an approved budget to, you know, get something done than for an experienced team to get a budget approved or even to get buy-in or even to get um even to get that round table meeting to happen right and a lot of times because with journey maps or with even every type of process mapping tool you'd find that process improvement usually would have a long-term effect and even and sometimes not a lot of short-term effects right so you're mapping a journey that's only probably going to reap rewards say three months down the line or my favorite word again is waste you're all about eliminating waste and there's literally no return on investment yet for a very long time and then you have to justify why eliminating waste is so important to the business and why if we're not eliminating waste then we're not making space available for you know much more value to be maximized yes and john even says people are not even familiar with what journey man mapping is Quite frankly, this is very shocking to me, but he's super, or she is super, Martins is super red, and it can be very sad. But this is what it is. Okay, so let's get um, into the next one. 
Okay. So I found by experience and that with a lot of thoughts that most of the problem is how we actually approach journey mapping. We may be familiar with the glass half full and half empty situation. So there's a popular um, motivational thing we say where there's a picture of a glass with water in it, right? And then it's usually half empty and you'll ask, what do you see, half empty or half full? And usually whichever you say can be used to deduce um, your perception towards problem and your ability to solve problems, right? Or even how you perceive problems, right? So with everything and with this particularly, approach and perception controls the narrative, right? And therefore the outcomes, right? So um, we can also respond to this by commenting how we generally approach and describe journey management, journey mapping rather than pretty excited to see this one. How do you usually approach journey mapping, process mapping, what's it like to you? A strategic document, um, you wake up in the morning or you just had a meeting with your team and say, oh, we're going to journey map and you have a journey map ready in two hours, over an hour, 30 minutes, um, or you use a tool, you do paper and pen, um, you know, there's no proper document um, or there is a document and afterwards you send it off. Beautiful. I love that I'm getting responses. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you, Julie. I describe maps as alignment diagrams. I love it. And that it's more about the mapping than maps. I love it. I love it so much. Therefore, a collaborative approach is the best way to address the problems you identified on the last slide. I love it so much. That's so good. I start by trying to define the problem statement to guide the approach from there. I love it. Start with trying to get a visual that makes sense rather than data step that we're trying to get that makes sense rather than the data mm, okay build together in the cross-functional setup involving stakeholders that are interacting with users i love it i wanted to try to get journey data from google analytics okay but i realized that i need to look a lot of places okay sometimes it's just to document the as this situation so you can see possibly what's going wrong and can be improved i loved it love it Starting with the generic support process based on topic. Mm, Vanessa, can you expand that for me? Just so I have um, better understanding of what you mean by generic support process. Okay, so we'll move on and we'll use that while we're getting more in the chats. Thank you so much for your responses, everyone. Okay, pretty much how I like to think about it because it is what it is, journey mapping is process improvement at its core. So PI is process improvement. At its core, everything you're trying to do with the entire time you're spending journey mapping, the entire time you're spending mapping, the entire time you're spending um, process mapping, whatever terms you may use, um, um, diagramming, it should be because you're trying to improve, improve a process or you're trying to optimize, you're trying to design a new process, right? And if we do understand that journey mapping is indeed process improvement or process optimization in itself, then it then would drive how we get it done, right? It would then drive how we get data, if we even get data, who we're speaking to, what we're speaking to, you know, what we quantify as success of the entire project and process, right? So your CJMs, customer journey map, should be factual strategy documents, right? Um, it should be a strategy document and always should be a strategy document. And what do I mean? It should be a document that's able to drive the, direction of the business, or at least show reference to the direction of the business, or at least take into a reference where the business has come from, where we are now, or where we are headed, right? So this is an image of a journey map, or pardon me, a process map. This is a process, my field chat actually. Okay, so I need to close out this slide. So this distracting. Yeah, that's a little bit done. Okay, journey maps are ideally process design or process improvement tools. And like every process improvement tool, we start out with the what, the why, who for, and then measure, right? So the what and why would mean the business problem, needs and goals. This would be your metrics, who for, customer and process users, and this will lead to your personal data. And then how is the data? So I always, always say, 
that assumptive maps create problems or new solutions for problems that do not exist. I say this every single time with journey mapping, with process mapping, with every diagramming process you have to do in experience management is the fact that if you simply create a fluffy document because it is pretty or try to inflate it, you're creating new problems, right? Or beautifully new solutions for problems that never exist. And this is why and how it plays out. Um, the business is, for instance, dealing with, let us use hypothetically, business is dealing with an awareness problem. So there's a lot of marketing efforts going on, but nobody's seeing the business, right? And then your journey mapping there is this process of how customers go through awareness and the consideration stage. And then you go ahead to inflate the numbers, right? Or idealistically, you know, sit and assume how it actually happens as opposed to researching and finding out or even, you know, simulating that experience. And then you journey map how customers find you through family and friends, um, how customers find you through um, out of out of home marketing strategies. And you do that document. It's so fluffy, so pretty, it goes up to the management. Now, the problem with that is you're supposed to be optimizing an effort that the marketing team is working on, right? Now, when the management says that, or when the marketing team says that document, you have therefore implied that the most profitable um, systems or entry points for customers have been out of home marketing and word of mouth. And then it's no little wonder why the business would go ahead to think that the referral scheme is the best thing that should happen to the customers because clearly your document has shown that as of today, word of mouth marketing is the best thing for us, right? And the same thing with even understating the problem is that it doesn't drive urgency. So we should not be overstating and understating. We need to tell it as it really is, right? The more assumptive we are, the more problems or we even divert the entire effort to creating, you know, fixing, creating new solutions for problems that never existed or, you know, did not even need that effort. All right. So process improvement is the proactive task of identifying a process in need of reform and improvement, analyzing this process to see what issues need addressing, changing key aspects, steps and tasks in your process to improve its overall performance. Essentially, this means that the GM's quality is directly proportional to business improvement efforts, and if done right, impacts the same and vice versa. Typically, to say that the quality of the process map, the quality of the process improvement um, tool that you're using, the what you actually do with it, what it does look like, what you put into it, will directly impact the business improvement efforts, negatively or positively. So yeah, the design of the map is aimed at execution, removing waste. Waste, 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 waste is such a powerful word that I really love. And the reason is because there's waste in a lot of things. Either you're duplicating an effort or you're overproducing for an effort or you're underutilizing an effort or um, we're creating more bottlenecks. Right. And the problem with this is that we need to be able to see our process improvement efforts, process mapping efforts from those points. And this is why when you're journey mapping, when you're speaking with, I would use process mapping probably going forward because it's more general for a lot of tools. When you're process mapping, you have to understand that there, there may be a single customer that you're process mapping the experience in the sense that your process of mapping, the segment of customers trying to get onboarded. But that document needs to get to your stakeholders. That document's recommendations, the summary needs to get to the management. You need buy-in for implementation and execution, right? So it's important to speak the language that the business understands. And it's beautiful to be able to meet at that middle ground where it shows that you clearly understand that the business is in it to make profits, right? while you're in it to, you know, as middle person that's trying to make sure that the customers have satisfaction, whatever customer's term and satisfaction at that phase of their journey, and the business is at it making profit, right? So you're yeah, making processes and people more efficient. So I need us to realize how important our journey maps are. That's why I've gone through this, because it's super important that we understand that I'm not spending hours and weeks and months even, you know, just creating a fluffy document. I am not using the prettiest tool on earth to create a document that 
is literally not correct, not true, um, will have no impact on the business, will have no impact on the processes, will have no impact on the people that worked on it, will have no impact on, you know, basically a waste of my time, right? And if you're the one mapping the waste of your time and waste of everybody's time, right? So it's important that we understand that journey mapping, process mapping, all of that are super, super important because by doing it right or not doing it at all or doing it incorrectly, you, you know, impacts the business because it sees process improvement, right? So, um, and this naturally drives how we create and how we even measure its impact. Process maps are crucial when it comes to process improvement. Typically, how can you seek to actively and successfully improve your process if you can't see it? It's very important to ask. Visualization is such a powerful tool, if only what we know, that if I told you, I mean, if you're very familiar with Google Maps, um, when you try to search a location, right, from your current location to your destination, there are two ways the map can come up. There's the diagramic version that you could click a car logo, and it's moving and you can see the streets and all of that. That's pretty much what I see a lot of people use most times. There's also another version that allows you to see on the same app actually, that allows you to see a step-by-step -step how to 300, you know, in 300 meters turn left, in 300 um, kilometers turn right, or turn by this brown street or turn by here. There are two ways, but most people tend to use the first version, right? At least I tend to use, and everybody was I know tends to use. And if you're driving, you're most likely using the first as well. And it's mostly because visualization is so powerful. Visualization is the best way to show and tell at the same time, right? As opposed to just having words. And that again drives impact for why you should be process mapping. That again screams to why you should be visualizing, you know, maps and visualizing process improvement plans and strategies because you're showing and you're telling. And that's more powerful than just telling, as we see with the other Google map option of, you know, just seeing how many steps it will take you and all that. Okay, so waste and opportunities. Reportedly, so I've heard, a lot of internal business processes are mostly siloed. Um, I hear a lot and I have seen a lot that it's usually a case where the delivery team has poor understanding or little no, little understanding on how their efforts directly impacts the order placement team, right? So what you have is a single process, 100 process owners, because they have 100 teams that make the single process, you know, the whole process possible, right? But they do not see how they all are working together. They do not see cross-functionality as strengths, right? And that is such a problem, right? Because in general, this affects customer satisfaction. When you're buying a product or paying for a service as a customer, you never see the individual teams in between, never, right? You see a single product or a single service. Um, I'm buying stuff off an e-commerce site. I have no idea that there are 300 teams within the organization. It's pretty much none of my business. I don't even want to know. I shouldn't even know, right? All I know, I go to your website or whatever touch points is available, a phone call or your website. I placed my order. I was told I get in three days. I did get it in three days. It was delivered to my doorstep. There's probably some service, you know, delivery process. And that happens. And all I would say is Amazon delivered to me, right? Or eBay delivered to me. It would not matter that there are four teams that made that happen. And so uh, internally, it makes absolutely no sense when internally it's then super siloed, right? Because at the end of the day, the customer isn't seeing the many siloed processes. They only see one. And so if we're not all working together or we do not all see how um, that very simple three minutes delay in how long it took to place the order, how long that affects you know, the next process, because it's all impact. If you see process maps, you see that it's always a flow, right? Or, you know, something flows into another. So a single process typically affects another process. So if I do not understand how that three minutes delay or that QA done wrong on that product affects the quality of product that the customer at the end would, would receive, that's very terrible, right? So it's worth remembering that the approach to process improvements can take different forms. You're maybe trying to improve a single process. You're improving a series of processes for a department. You're reviewing and seeking to improve all processes across the organization, or you're implementing a rolling continuous improvement plan. So sometimes it's improvement. Sometimes it is design. That's, you know, from scratch. 
So it's important that you're recognizing value add, non-value add, and value add but required processes. And this is, you know, there'll be times where where you're mapping processes and you can tell, or you're improving a process, reviewing and improving and optimizing, and you can tell that it would absolutely do not need to have this happen, right? Adds no value, and by no value add, nobody's paying for it, right? It doesn't make the product a better version, right? Basically, it's wasteful, right? Or, you know, it's value adding, customers are willing to pay for that extra effort, that extra fine tuning that we do, and it makes the business better, it's profitable for us. On, there are sometimes there's non-value add, but it's required. It could be based on who is demanding, you know, that that process is optimized. It could be from a top, um, someone up there in the management is asking for a process to be reviewed, right? It could be because there are legal implications in the country that makes it important to have that process. And so you need to know all of your processes, or at least try your very best to be certain which of them fall into these groups so that you're properly so that you're properly, um, you know, grouping them as those, yeah. So as is mapping, when you look to, in, when you first look to improve a process, you need to first map out the as is process. The as is process informs for your to be. At this point, you want to see the process as it is, not as it should be, not an idealistic version of the process, right, as it actually is. And like I said before, and I'll keep saying to a very long time, Assumptive maps create problems or new solutions or problems that do not exist. So you must bear in mind that we are solving a problem, right? We must bear in mind that we are making something better, right? There's always an easier way to do it. Something I always say, there's, there's actually always an easier way to do it, but there's the best way to do it. There's the best way possible that you are aware of to do it, right? And that should be a driving force for why you want to take the extra time, go the extra mile to make it work. So I'd earlier learned this sometime, I think two years ago or three, that you can't expand an existing um, collected data set. You can narrow it down. So with journey maps and with every type of process mapping, the more is merrier with data sets. So let me explain this a bit more. If um, I needed, if I came to this group now, everybody here, eight, five of us, and I asked um, for your first names, right? Or rather, I asked you yeah, asked for your first names, asked for your last names as well, asked for your date of birth, asked for where you were born, when you were born, how you were born. I got all of that information. Great. Then I versus case B, I came and I only asked for our names and maybe um date of birth, I think, something like that. Now, with the first case, I have a lot of information, but what that does for me is that. At the point where I decide I only want to work with how you were born, right? I have the luxury of choice to say, oh, I can deal with how you were born. Even with how, with how you were born, I could decide to narrow down to maybe I want to choose um, some information that is um, common to everybody, but it's how. Now with the case B is that I have little information. And with that, once we all leave this group or this call or this session i cannot expand the data beyond that right but i can always narrow the first so you find that with data collection which you should do in a lot of in journey map and i'll show us all of that along as we speak is a lot of data is a lot of simulation a lot of testing a lot of reconfirmation of the efforts a lot of um reading process documents just because it's always easier to narrow down than just to expand when you know everybody disperses. To be mapping, based on the as is map, we can then move forward and then create a to be process, right? To be process is your perfect idealistic process. This is, you know, where you're free to dream, right? Um, assuming that everything you say sounds like honey to your management, everything you say is completely convincing, everything you say um, works, right? There are no legal restrictions and every stakeholder is your best friend. This is your dream. You're free to dream at this point because, again, you're free to dream, right? So the Aziz map will naturally direct this because you have learned from your Aziz map every, the loops and all of that. So you're free to dream with your to be maps, right? And just have fun. Then your realized map is <laughs> reality, right? So once you've mapped the current process, what we want it to be, there's usually what then happens, 
right, with process mapping and process improvement. There's how, you know, we went all out to be dreamy. And I do encourage you, I do encourage you to be very dreamy, right? Because a lot of times it's easier to even narrow down from your dreamy expectations for that process than to expand, especially when you're then speaking to teams that look at, that may be considering the risk um, with what you're proposing, the budget with what you're proposing. Think, think of it this way. Your budget on your to-be map maybe to be processed for your two processes, $100 million, for instance, right? It's easier to beat that down to $80 million than if you had said $20 million. You're less likely to get anything raised on that, right? So dream, but then there's always the reality, then there's the realized map. So you want to have, you know, an, a proper understanding of what, all, what they all look like, because at the end of the day, this is what you go home with, the realized map. A single simple rule is never use assumptive information on your maps. Never, ever, ever, ever. The quality of your JMs determines the quality of solutions that you can stem from them. And the goal of the goal is process improvement, not problem creation, right? So real personas, real empathy maps. If you don't know what those are, I'll definitely be showing you soon. Real timelines and real experiences as well. So sourcing data, primary and secondary data, depending on you know what you have, but I always believe that you can get as much as you can, right? So you want to as much as possible, get as much primary data and as much secondary data as you can as well. So with sourcing data, you want to start with your objectives and the why. I know somebody mentioned, one of us mentioned that, and that's super important. You have to start with your why. why are we improving this process? I know I have earlier said journey maps are process improvement tools, but why? Why are we trying to improve our process, right? Are we improving because it's you know nice to do, nice to look at why? Why are we doing that? Why are we going through that effort? Why are we doing that, right? Remember at the end of the day, every single effort you're doing, you want to be able to sell that effort to, you want to be able to sell that effort to your stakeholders. You want to be able to sell that effort, that time taken, and I do consider time cost. So you want to be able to sell the reason for that time as well. So your why is as strong as, will actually drive how strong your how would it be as well. Then you want to evaluate your, the problem. Identify and record the needs, problems, and goals. Research and research, right? So talk to stakeholders, SMEs, get VOC reports, um, yeah, so um, make sure there are real problems. If not, we create more problems. Research, personnel building, you can, they can be assumptive. Um, research the touch points, consult your stakeholders. So too little times, often so often, right? I find that we have different stories of the same story we're working on. If you looked at the e-commerce you know, example we had before and you asked the contact center person, what happens when customers call in? They tell you, when customers call, we spend two minutes with the customer, the customer picks the item and it takes about four days and customers get the item and they are all happy, right? And then you ask the delivery team and delivery team tells you every time we deliver products, customers in a particular area, they are always grumpy when they receive our products. Then you ask somebody else in the product team and their stories are different. And you find that across the organizations, they're usually varying responses and stories that we tell about the same situation. And it's pretty, pretty normal, right? There's something I used to do back then um, in school. We will put in fine art classes, we'll put something before us and then we'll sit around it and then have to draw and find out that we ended up drawing different parts of the same item because we're all looking at it differently. We're always, always looking at it differently. So, um, yeah, so speak to all teams. Um, yeah, speak to all the teams involved, all user teams. Co speak to the contact center, data team, QA call records. Now, in this part of it, I like to think of it as enriching the map, and it's important that you think of all your process contributors as process contributors. Every single thing they do contributes to how far along the journey goes. Right. Again, if we're looking at it in a siloed way, it looks very tiny and inconsequential. But as the full story unravels, you find out that if that call wasn't made to the prospective client by, by the business development team, 
you may not have had a customer coming at onboarding and maybe the finance team have nothing to do. So when we look at the, at the whole picture, there is how it all comes together as a big house. And so when you're sourcing data, speak to your process contributors. Their stories will differ, but you need all of it. You need all of it. And please, and please record everything that you get. Um, particularly speak to those that speak to your users, right? Speak to those that speak to your users. Speak to those that work directly with those that speak to your users. Speak to everybody that you can speak to. And while you identify your process contributors, you want to be sure to identify the role that they all individually take. So for instance, you're looking at the contact center. There are the agents that make the calls possible. Then there are those that supervise them. Then there are those that lead those that supervise them, right? If you're trying to find out the experience of customers on the phone call, you may want to be speaking to the agents instead. Right. If you wanted to understand better um, the motions or of the contact center agents, you may want to be speaking to their managers instead. Right. So all of this would determine. So at every time when you're thinking of your objectives, you're thinking of your who that you who you're going along that journey with, and this would be your end users. And we know that the the industry will de determine who we call your end user. The process will determine a B2B company is different and a B2B to C is different. A D2C, of course, it's different. And an in internal journey mapping process is different where you are simply improving the processes for your team or improving the processes for the organization. It definitely is very different. Then we'll determine who you are speaking to, why and how, and what information you're trying to drive at, right? Again, go for as much as you can. I, and which is my favorite word. So I like to get as much as I as I can, right? Particularly, um, if you if if your journey mapping or your process mapping processes that will include end users that are outside your organization, I advise you to listen to QA calls if you can, right? Because you're going to do an empathy map. You're going to want to understand the emotions that are expressed. You want to be able to say customers are anxious when they go through this process, right? Customers are you know, customers are anxious because we sometimes quickly forget that customers make very emotional purchases. Every single purchase is pretty emotional, right? Unless you're buying water and you're buying a place over your you know, head roof, which is paying rent or buying a house or you're buying water or food to eat. It's pretty, it doesn't fall under, you know, things that you necessarily can't do without. So a lot of the times customers are simply choosing you over their emotions. They are buying quickly because they think it will look nice on them because you know you sell better right so you need to understand that customers buy or use your service because you are appealing to their emotions and it's pretty much why predictive selling is beautiful right you're buying stuff on amazon and then it shows up and tells you customers other customers have bought this along with right and it then tell makes you feel like mm, i probably need this with this or you really don't, <laughs> and you really can't do without it. But but in reality, we are not thinking this much. We're not thinking this logically when we're making purchases. We're simply buying and buying or paying and paying and paying and paying. And so if you're not considering the emotional state of your customers, uh, that's a problem because that's in the first place is the reason why they're buying or not buying, right? We stop buying for stuff for reasons like, I don't like how they talked to me. I don't like how the shop felt. I don't like how the shop smelt. I don't like how, I don't like that they keep me on the phone for three minutes longer. I don't like that their debit card doesn't have my name on it. I hate that every time I try to make a purchase, I have to make a call first. Those things matter. So speak to them. If you speak to your customers, if you no, rather listen to the calls if you can. You don't speak to your customers, but listen to the calls if you can. Um, simulate the instars because the last two are my very favorite, right? So with social listening, that's um, what the POC does. That's getting a gauge of how your customers perceive you, right? And this is basically understanding how they perceive you by things they've posted about your brand, your business on social media. It does help you understand their state of mind as well. Now, simulating is my favorite thing in the world. And that's because you need to, you by yourself, be able to say that you have gone through the process. And my why for this, and why it's one of my favorite things to do is because customers 
we are all looking at story from different points, and that's inevitable. But you're the person that's in between the business and the customers, and I hope you're that person. But you should always be in between the business and the customer. You should always be the person with proper understanding of what the business is trying to achieve and what the customers may be feeling or be trying to achieve at that time as well. And you're in the middle. So customers are trying to you know, fulfill their needs and make that purchase or pay for that. And they can't, and that happens. Someone else on the business and who's creating the process or making the process possible is trying to get their job done. You are the middle, but your job is to make sure that we bring in balance. So when you simulate processes and effort, as opposed to even just listening and you know reading papers, it helps you bring in that middle. So you're reviewing the onboarding process, but you're not just checking the onboarding. You're not just reviewing that onboarding process as a customer that's trying to get onboarded. You're trying to get onboarded as a customer, but you're also trying to see how much problems and risk and waste may be happening because you're part of the business. So it's such a valuable, strong point for me every time. Talk to your users. Please talk to them and be your user as well. That's so important. Now with personas and building personas, identify your customer segments, segment them, gather data, analyze and develop personas. I almost feel like I'm running out of time, so I'm going to be really quick here. Um, ideally, you want to be sure that you are not being very fluffy with your personas. You want to make sure they are data backed and data led and even data built, if that's a word. And this is why the products that you're selling or your business is selling and the service has a need because the personas have a need right they are useful because the personas have a need um wristwatches are only useful because i need to tell the time and have it on my hand right now if your personas do not properly show or cannot properly show the need that they have when you map them you're understating the usefulness of the product you're also understating and or maybe overstating how useful your product is right because you're then over emphasizing or you know exaggerating who your buyers are or you know not telling the entire story and there's always a problem with that as well okay so with mapping the roi the goal here is to show and reflect how much the business makes and leaves at the table through wastes and opportunities. So time is a cost, like I said, and therefore you should be quantifying that effort. So know your metrics. Always, 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 always know your metrics, right? And with knowing your metrics, there are two points to look at it from. There is the customer's needs and business needs. They're never the same thing. It's, usual, it's usually funny that we think they are, but they're never the same thing. At the point of onboarding, the business is probably thinking about acquisition. The customer is not thinking of acquisition. The customer doesn't care that you think of acquisition. If the customer understands that you think of acquisition, they would understand you're more transactional than loving with them. And they, you don't want them to know that they're just one of the 1,000 you're trying to get. You want them to think they're your only customer, right? And that's how we want them to feel. But the business is at that point is acquisition. But the customer is trying to get onboarded quickly, safely, um, you know, um, in time as well, right? Right. So it's important that you understand the business needs, goals, and the customer's needs, which is why you need to constantly be the person that understands the needs for both of them. You need to understand the needs for business and needs for customers. So oftentimes we fail to realize how different they are and how both needs are viewed greatly impacts them business teams now um if we if for instance okay using the example with onboarding and acquisition right when the business team forgets that the customer is simply trying to get onboarded you know get on your app because they want to use your they want a mobile app that lets them bank as opposed to going to the bank physically or using the card if we forget that that's what they only that's all they care about and we as the business think we're just trying to increase the numbers we tend to focus more on functionality and throw experience out the door because we are not paying attention to the fact that for the person who is using there is an entire emotion roller coaster going on and when we do that every time we keep trumping experience every time we keep trumping experience we have functionality to then suffer if you keep trumping experience functionality will soon go out the door as well so you want to be sure that you're seen you know you're paying attention to the 360 scene what i usually do i should customer needs per phase even with your documents you know you're paying attention to 
the customer's needs and the business needs and goals per phase as well. So the addition of these steps usually show how the business teams shows rather me, pardon me. The addition of these steps would show the business teams how siloed the efforts are making or marrying the customers and how each step and process contributes to a successful transaction or not. All right. Okay, so case study. So the problem here was the BNPL e-commerce experience had increased CS over time. So CS is customer for score. And it's one of those metrics that I think that doesn't get enough, enough shine on the lights, really. Um, there's a lot of noise saying that would rather loosely on NPS and CSATs, but there's very little on CES. And CES is super important. In fact, CES is measuring how much effort your customer is taking. If we remember we're emotional buyers, we will pay attention a lot more to effort, right? When um you're trying to, every, every time, every single time I'm trying to sign up on a new website or login, I love it so much. I love it so much that I simply click on signing with Google and I don't have to ever remember my password. I cannot be thankful enough to Google and to every single service provider that chooses to integrate. I cannot be thankful enough because it reduces the effort of my bit, right? And I'm an emotional buyer as well. I'm an emotional service user as well. I'm an emotional customer as well. And so once you increase the effort, if there are three clicks that I could have done one, you're stressing me and you're stressing your users, right? Um, if they have to go through 12 processes because we can make them go through 12 processes, but we could have done five where really, really stressing customers and people, right? And the problem with that is we've forgotten that they're emotional. And because they're emotional, they're tired halfway, right? And there's, there's this thing with the pick and roll. And if they're tired halfway, a lot of times it may not matter how beautiful your service is, right? It just it just spoils everything. So you want to add every single time, think through effort, right? There are heuristics that helps, help rather. You can check Nelson Norman, his a favorite, right? Um, he has um, UX heuristics on his website that totally help. There's usability and memorability as well. You want to think through why am I letting customers, why am I putting customers through the effort of having to remember a password, right? Why does the string of numbers have to be 16 digits? letters and numbers put together who's going to ever remember that not me not you so why make them go through that right why can we have something more memorable why can't we make it easier to exit the option right and the very simple one that we should even do a lot more is customer education why can't we educate customers better at each point right because at every single time customers may be dealing with anxiety with that button right and with co communicating or choosing not to communicate to them. And it can be the little things, your error messages, how they're written, or the presence of them, or even the absence of them, right, can go a very long way, making sure that the effort is reduced because they always, always know what to do. I always say that error messages should be telling you where you're at and how to fix what you're doing, at least self-service to an extent. Even if your self-service option ends up being call our contact center, but it should be saying something that lets me know I can get out of that box, right? You'd only realize how, how emotional customers can be when you process how emotional you are, when you make purchases, when you're stuck on a page and it feels like you're claustrophobic, but you're actually just on a page. And that's how emotional we are, right? When you're trying to make a purchase and it didn't go through, you didn't get an approval page or a success page and you're worried, oh, did that, did that transaction go through? Why didn't I get a success page? Why didn't I get a decline page? Oh, and um, you know, you haven't got a mail from your bank yet. So you're not sure why is it taking this long, right? Should I make transaction happen twice? Should I do it the third time? Will it work the fourth time? Why did it fail the last time? That's so much, right? And that's how much we process as people, literally. And that's how much your customers process as well. So please and please pay attention to the fact that your customers are people. We are, I'm a person, you're a person. So we are people, we have emotions. You shouldn't be increasing customer efforts. Try your variables to always keep that on minimal, right? So over the period of six months to two years, also to say that you there are really no 100% perfect processes. You'd have, um, processes that fail, you'd have processes that you've even worked on and failed over time and you'd have to 
rejig it. It's important, it's fine to rejig. It's never a problem to rejig. In fact, it's a good thing. It means that you're either paying attention, somebody in the organization is paying attention, right? But it also means that you're moving forward. So yeah, which rejigged. So back to the problem here. The BNPL, that's been on pay later, e-commerce experience, had increased CES over the period of six months to two years with customers scoring low for NPS and CSAT. Most of the complaints were technical issues, onboarding, adding to cards, checkout, quality of products received, rich delivery SLAs, very siloed processes, and hostile work systems. Now here we see everything wrong. Quite frankly, this was me putting it rather literally. Everything was wrong. Every single thing was wrong. Everything was very wrong, right? And so the task here was really to map for it, for impact, right? So how we solved, and I'll speak about this, needs identification with this understanding who the business is, what the business is, who your customers are, what your customers are doing. There is such a powerful impact with understanding the business. I, I I can't overemphasize this. When you're having a meeting with, you know, other process contributors or stakeholders, and this is not even about this at the moment, but you know, it just dropped and may be very helpful again to say it again. When you're having a meeting with other stakeholders and they're trying to improve a process, you need to understand that you have different needs, even internally. For instance, you're trying to improve the onboarding process or the checkout process for a um, for a website. And you're meeting with the contact center, the service team, the onboarding team, the value expansion team, maybe retention team. You're meeting with the risk team, compliance team, legal team. You're meeting with maybe somebody in operations. When you know, all these things sit together in a meeting, virtual, physical, we all have different needs. We all have different parts we're looking at this story from. So you tend to realize that the risk person is the loudest with saying, we can't overexpose the business. The compliance person also says, says something like that. We can't overexpose the business. We can't do that. We can't flout that rule. We can't, you know, they usually say a lot of can'ts actually. Then with the legal team, there is a law that we can't, they say a lot of can'ts as well. And then with the contacts and uh, the service team, they're simply thinking of efforts. They're thinking of, oh, we do not want to have to call 400 more people. We do not have to want to take 400 more calls. We do not want to have to extend our shifts 24 hours because, you know, we want to have, rather have shorter shifts, more people in the team because they're thinking of how it impacts their job. With the person who is responsible for increasing value and retention, the person is probably thinking of cross-selling. So I don't like this process because it's hard to cross-sell. I like how easy this is because it's easy to cross-sell. And when you're in that room as the process improvement person, it's important to understand that before that meeting, and the data person is just thinking through numbers. And it's always important to remember that that's how we naturally think. We think from the point of our front line, right? So when you're in that room having those meetings and you're trying to bid for a process to be changed, it's important you're speaking everybody's language as well. It's really important to be that person that understands what the needs are for the individual teams and then how what the business needs are. And it would show in how you communicate and when you're communicating and overly hitting on the customer's needs. Because in all honesty, who they've defined as their customers are different at that point, and it's nobody's fault. So you want to show that you understand, and that's a very strong way to drive for impact, even when communicating internally with your stakeholders. Okay, so here, you know, there was identification of the needs for business and customers, data gathering, personal design, stakeholder management, mapping, ownership, and all these things. So I'm going to be showing the map particularly because it shows how we got things done. So yeah, by the way, we use your expressions well, and it's not an advert. I love, 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 love it. So for many reasons, you would see why. So yeah, so you would find that the empathy map, there's an empathy map here. It's something you can do with this, and that's pretty much a very powerful point. And I'll explain when we're there, how this generally impacts um, the quality of buying you can get and even the map that you're doing. So the first thing here was timeline. I had seen someone say in the chat about, you know, entering the timeline as part of the data that you include. Yes, please always do that. Please, 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 please always, always do that. Beyond that is also the phase and the sub phase. Now, this took 
quite a long time together. And part of that was my fault. And that was because all through the journey, I kept emphasizing that we needed to enrich this, right? So you find that, you know, you start mapping, you go back to some data points, you speak with the data team, some new data comes up. You speak with customers, you listen to calls, you simulate, you get, you lay hold of some process document and it then enriches your document and you keep going back and going back. It's never been a problem to make your data map, your process maps better than they were. So please always do that. So you have phases and then the, sub phases as well storyboard now with your maps please make sure that your storyboarding powerful thing with storyboarding is that storyboards help you generally see storyboards generally help you see um visualize remember what we said about showing and telling right it visualizes what the problem is and you know add your screenshots and data and every single proof that you have here, but storyboard with real information. As you see that we have, we just storyboard what you can, right? Then um, action taking, we added this. I want to run through this really quickly. So include the action and really important to stay here is that as much as you can, as much as you can, do not overstate the situation and understate it. Now, every single information you're going to have on your um process maps are going to influence some business action, right? So you want to be very, very, very careful with making sure that you are stating things as they are. Because for instance, if your arena stage says heard from heard about so 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 from friends and family and colleagues, it does say a lot about where the efforts should be concentrated. Right. And if you're not stating that properly, that's it. That's not helpful for the marketing team as well. And so you want to go through action taking throughout all the entire phases um, and show all of this, right? You want to show all of this. You want to show every single data. Remember that when you're process mapping, your target is actually those that would drive change, right? And that could be some manager, three managers, um, top board management, your, your own manager, right? Or even some external management team. You want to make sure that you're speaking in their language and you're, as much as you can, convincing information. And it's always very helpful to put some information about, at consideration stage, I always advise, play around with adding competitive names and competitors names because it does help with showing that you're not the only one in the market and it's really a tussle. So it's important to show that it's my tip actually. Right, so, you know, channels, show your channels. Your expression lets you show channels, touch points as well. And so it allows you to visualize even much more. So there's that touch points as well. Customers, this is one of my favorite, 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 favorite part ever. And with customers, what that you can get this from your social listening tools. You can get this from VOC reports. What this does for you is basically, it takes you out of the picture and puts the customers in the picture. How? Prior to that, you're most likely saying the process is terrible. I, I, customers are saying they can't do anything. Customers are doing this. But when you present verbal things, you show that it's very obvious who said they can't get anything done, right? Because it's in the first person and customer is speaking in the first person and saying, I can't proceed. I can't make that action happen, right? And definitely has that impact, right? So with identified gaps as well, we show that. Then with your experience, this is your empathy mapping. Now, with empathy mapping, right, it's important that you're showing as much emotion as you can, right? And you see here that emotion goes from upward and then slopes downward, right? Is it to draw insights from this and even conclude that it was a terrible experience and is a terrible experience, right? So you want to show all of that as well. Pretty much, if you're looking at this, as a stakeholder, when you see this, your thoughts are, how are we so terrible? How do we, you know, keep, get you interested at first and then get you to indifferent? That's terrible, right? And as a stakeholder, this is such a powerful point, but it's even more powerful because remember what we have said about being emotional bias, it drives impact on that as well to show that Emotions are changing throughout the journey. Emotions are changing. Emotions are being affected. People are being, are uh, not feeling excited. You know, 
they're losing interest really, right? Then your recommendations, um, opportunities, um, supporting data, business goals, KPIs, and recommendations. Now I'm going to hammer on business goals and KPIs. This is very important to add because it shows that, remember what we have said, or I have said, that we want to make sure that we can show by how we speak that we care about the business owners, the business and the customers, right? So we want to show business goals and KPIs. And I have um, some notes on, you know, um, why that's important, but super important because you want to show that you have listened to the customers and you know the business goal, right? Every time you go to a business team or the business team and you're hammering on how customers are unable to buy, customers are customers are complaining, it does feel like you're simply saying they're not doing their job right, right? And you don't want to come off that way because you don't want it to come off as though you're having, you are praising their jobs, right? And I should have mentioned this earlier, at the point where you're data sourcing and you're speaking to other process contributors, a usual pushback is that they tend to, it tends to feel like you're about to intrude into their space and nobody likes that. So you find that walls are usually up. Nobody wants to share completely how the process goes or how it feels because, you know, walls are up and it does feel like you're appraising their jobs. And so what you want to have get, you know, going for you there is to establish that we're here on common interests, right? I'm here to make your work even easier, right? And you want to communicate that as 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 clearly as you can, right? That I'm here to make your work easier. You make you make our work easier as well. If you do this, right? We're here to make it better. I'm appraising the process, not your job, right? And so when you constantly tell the product team, oh, you know, this is not working, or you tell the business team, this is not working, customers are saying it's not working, it shows that you may be negligent of what happens that makes the business the business, right? So when you speak from the point of their KPIs, their metrics, they consider important as well. And then you talk about what customers are saying and feeling, it shows that you're clear, you clearly understand how money comes in in the first place or how we even lose the money and how we make profit and lose it, right? So you want to show all of that. So to, to drive, drive KPIs and even get them, you simply have to determine key strategic objectives and with determining what is important for the business, what is important for that step, you can then define success, right? So at onboarding stage, what's important to the business, right? Are we trying to drive awareness? Are we trying to drive an um, acquisition? What do we, how do we measure the goal? How do we measure awareness? How do we measure interest? In this case, it would be impression, which and referrals, right? And, you know, so you want to do that across board at every point and say, okay, this is what we're measuring, this is what we're measuring, this is what we're measuring, right? It also shows how detailed you are as the process implement team and testing, showing that um, you're able to understand that the business has goals at every time, right? It has goals at every time. That time, time is supposed to be converting at every stage and you see that, you know that, you're aware as well. Okay, and then definitely have your recommendations, right? And most importantly, to close it all out, always have task owners. Always, always, always have task owners. Every time that you leave um, a process improvement meeting and there's no timeline, and no task owners. You've not done anything completely, right? You may as well, you may as well come back two weeks after and nothing is done. So you need to have owners for every single change you're driving, have timelines as well, right? And I know that this, this is an as is, but then there is usually the to be, and then there's the realized, and they can differ, right? A lot of times there's there's a crazy difference between what you have proposed should be done, right? If everything is fluffy, possible, magical, and then what then happens? We want to document all of that, but where you need to be more, mostly data-driven is at here, the as is because you need to show as it is happening. And if you're trying to enrich your maps as much as you can, it may take a while, but again, we always would prefer quality, right? So um, um, do all of those, but of course have your, something I find that helps for me is try to have have what, what you consider your 
SOPs, what I would always do, right? Every time I'm reviewing your process, I would always simulate, I would do Gemba works. I would always ask, I would always read the process document. I would always compare with and best practice externally. I would always then see, you know, those things so that you can always take those boxes. What I hope you do is shorten the process time for when next you're improving your process, right? Because you already know everything you're needing to go through. And there may be some even extra things you need to go through. Um, yeah. Okay, so when, once you've defined what success is and you've defined how you're measuring and then you write your, KP, your KPIs and then you have all of this. So what you'd find, right, is that essentially the journey map itself is not even where the conversation of convincing your stakeholders should start, right? It should start prior to that. It starts from your why you're convincing them to go ahead to you know, let you go on that process or to let you do all of that. Something that pretty much helps is process mapping a smaller internal process, right? Process mapping, for instance, um, the current inbound call efforts, something like that, pretty small, has, um, there's almost no budget attached, right? It's fine. When you show impact on that, it's easier to then drive for bigger projects. Another thing that always, always helps is having somebody who is strategic, who is for strategic um, CX at the table of every discussion. Something that that does for you in an organization is that entirely if the person is sitting on that seat, by seat I mean role and has that title, it automatically helps you, it automatically helps the team, it helps the organization understand that your team that has been led is important, right? Don't forget, every part every part of the business is driving for profit, eliminating waste and driving opportunities. Yeah. So it means that at the time when hiring is done for that singular role or when that labor is being put, the thought process is you're going to drive in value, revenue, and profit. And if you have that person sitting at sit, it then cascades that um, confirmation bias cascade or rather that halo effect rather cascades down to every single effort the team put out to appear as strategic and you know take please use that to your advantage right and have have fun doing that right so yes with your process maps with your journey maps with every single map that you do whether you're flow chatting it doesn't even have to be a journey map whether you're flow chatting whether you're cyborging whatever it is Ensure that you're not overstating and you're not understating. Two so super important things. Ensure that you don't have as much information. As ensure that you've done your very best. By very best, do your very, very best to ensure that you have every single data you can have there, right? Have all of those there. And also ensure that prior to even the mapping, that right from your strategy meetings, right from the proposal meetings, that it's very clear that you're on the side of the business. I promise you that it gets you in faster you know, even into the hearts of the teams listening to you before, faster than you even realize because they perceive that you're on their side. They perceive that you understand the effort it takes them to get work done and how much that counts as well. So, um, so yeah, with results, ah, uh, with results for this was, you know, beyond the personal goals, there was also um, the fact that something we had not even set out to find out. We did find out, and that was primarily because we had an enriched map, really enriched process. It wasn't even about the map, because I mean, if you look at maps, it's a single one page document, but the number of weeks that went into getting that done, the number of the amount, the volume of data, primary and secondary data that went into putting a page out, the it was ridiculously crazy, right? And so the mapping is even more essential than the map that you put out. The how is so powerful. And I know that someone said that as well in chat and you know, that's me emphasizing that, yeah, that's super strong. And then we were able to find out that even if we had, we didn't have the contact center's response impacting the problem, but it became a beautiful thing that we found and proactively could fix, right? So we started out with a scope and please always start out with a scope of what you're fixing. It helps you even manage resources and time better. But then we were able to do much more than that, fix more proactively other issues because we were drilling and we were digging out and we were enriching our data, um, our journey maps and 
assessment of as well with so much data as we can go. So yes, it could have been a problem later on in the future, but then we could tackle it all more proactively because we had gone ahead and just done it right from the very beginning. All right. And that brings me to the end. So yeah, um, this is my thank you page. I'm on LinkedIn if you would like to follow me. My name is Chidara Koli. I'm the only one with the rocket emoji.